Hello and welcome to Big Finish fans. We're back after six months, um, which is kind of shocking. You know, life gets in the way and it just stops us doing these. But we're back to do another throwback review, this time looking up a story which is quite easy to obtain in my eyes, which is dust breeding. Now, this was the first story I listened to what wasn't the Ape Doctor related, so it's kind of special in that regard. Um, so what we'll be doing this hangout, we'll be doing the general news, uh, catch up, and obviously looking at this. Uh, so on tonight's show, who have we got? So let's have a look. Hello, TJ Productions here, and we're back in action after oh, God knows how long. It's great to be back. Uh, hello, Jarek from Reviews here. This is my, say, third Big Finish fans, I believe, first appeared in the Halloween special. Uh, and yeah, glad to be back in a great story. Yeah, I think it could be a fourth, actually. Yeah. Um, in terms of Big Finish fans, uh, we want to try and get as many done as possible while we've got time, because that's why none of them happened when they said, like, the War Doctor didn't happen because everyone's just doing their own lives and it's just trying hard to get everyone on. So without further ado, let's uh, go on to the news. So the first bit of news we sort of want to cover is Benny Unbound. This is how uh, Benny Summerfield is going to return with the Unbound Doctor. Obviously, she's been paired with the Sam Doctor for two box sets and now she's going to be with the David Warner Doctor. So that's going to be interesting. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, Unbound, it's not really been a audio range that I've explored as of yet, but uh, it does peak my, but it has piqued my interest in the past, mainly with just the David Warner stuff, and people have been begging for David Warner to be brought back, and so they've finally done it. Uh, I think the BBC have calmed down a bit on the whole Unbound stuff being used in Big Finish, so uh, they're allowing them to uh, uh, just explore a bit more with uh, Bernie Summerfield. A uh, bit of a shame, though, that for a Benny box set, again, it's going to be with a Doctor. Uh, it, it just doesn't really feel needed, because Benny was fine with about, what what was it, ten series and five other box sets. So uh, I, I think it is time for just her to just have a little just one-off box set of just hair on her own, uh, galvanting around the universe. But I'm really looking forward to... Uh, "Quote unquote," Sam Kiskard's master. Uh, we all know who that is uh, because you know uh, he just looks very extremely menacing on the front on the front cover. So yeah, I'm really just uh, looking forward to it, but not sure if this will be one I'll immediately buy. Probably buy it maybe as the months roll on. Right, Tom. Oh uh, yeah, I am. Um interested in this set because uh, I actually do adore and love Benicia Summerfield as a character and she's been going strong with Big Finish she started all the way back at the beginning in September 1998 with Oh No It Isn't and she's still going strong, did uh, many series single releases and then uh, box sets after and now with the Doctor and fortunately even though I do agree on James that it would be nice for Benicia Summerfield to have her own story and not have a Doctor I just don't see that really happening because they're trying to make the Benicia Summerfield stories a little bit more bigger in that, so I don't think they would downgrade, even though it would be nice to see Benicia on, on her own story. But, yeah, I doubt that to be happening. Uh, the New Adventures, you know, they've been pretty good box sets. Nothing absolutely mind-blown so far. Volume 1 was a pretty good. I did enjoy it. Volume 2 had its moments, I would say, but the resolution to it all wasn't very good. So it would be nice if Volume 3 does deliver. The Unbound Universe is something I haven't purchased just yet, but it has uh, got my... In I am interested in getting the set and the what-if scenarios to the story. It does sound very interesting. The Sympathy for the Devil and Masters of All, of course, features David Warner playing the Doctor, and he's going to be you back in his box set. So, yeah, of course I'm going to pre-order this. It's definitely on my list. Very much looking forward to it. It would be nice if it, you know, delivers, because as I said, the other box sets, they were good, but as I said, not mind-blowing. So it would be nice to give this rating maybe like a 9 out of 10, hopefully, but we have to uh, wait and see. But, yeah, it's out uh, next month, August. So, you yeah, know, definitely going to be checking that out and buying it. Have any of you listened to the recent podcast that they sort of showcase the theme? And I've got to say, the theme tune does sound pretty good. It does sound very... I think the person doing it, I think it was Howard Carter, was trying to 
or was it Blair Mount, I'm not sure, was trying to go back for 1960s feel like the what if scenario mm. in terms of theme because I think Delia Derbyshire was after a French put, a French company to do it, but obviously that fell through and obviously we've got the radiophonic, so it's going back to the what if uh, Delia went for this, so I've got to say that's quite interesting in that regard. Um, but it does seem to be a running trait with Big Finish with archaeologist companions, <clears throat> River Song, that they've got to have a doctor in that set to either boost sales because I don't think they've got the confidence in the characters, um, like I've said before. Because River Song, I don't think she's really tested the water in terms of Big Finish because obviously, first box set, you've got the eighth doctor, second, you've got six and seven, and it's happening with Bernice, um, with McCoy in the first two and now with David Warner. Um, but in terms of Unbound, I am yet to explore the Unbound stuff because it doesn't really interest me, um, if I'm being honest, because I think there's a whole catalogue of Doctor Who, what we all know, uh, let alone going into this other dimension of Doctor Who. But we sort of brought up an interesting point last night, didn't we, James, that could this be the end of the Unbound Doctor? Mm. Um, whether he self-sacrifices to save, because this the Unbound universe seems to be collapsing in, so this could be the end of the Unbound, really. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anything you want to add, James, about that? Well, I think it will probably be... Uh, I, I don't really think it's that far of an assumption or prediction, to be honest, because, you know... It's unbound. It's not can. It's not can in alternate universes. You can kill off who you want, and I really doubt the range will actually come back anytime soon. So, I don't know. I think that uh, the unbound Doctor maybe will die, and we'll actually see the Doctor actually sacrifice himself to save the universe. If you put it like that, it does sound very similar to the final game, the sort of story plan for to end the third Doctor, and it does mm. seem, if it does go down that line, very much Big Finish trying to do that. But I've, I've yeah. noticed that this Unbound set has got new writers, and if you look at the stuff coming out this year, Big Finish stuff have got new writers and new blood into the line, which is quite exciting, but yet yeah, quite daunting, because we don't really know what to expect, um, because obviously they've got to be high standard, because Big Finish are pretty good at high standard stuff, but that's Unbound, really. Um, may check it out. Um, towards the end of the year, but it's definitely not an immediate purchase for me because there's just other stuff I want to check out first. Uh, the next point, this is quite a big point for many people, is the vinyls of two of Big Finish's renowned stories, Spare Parts and Chimes of Midnight, uh, a hefty price tag of 79 quid, I think, so it's practically 80 quid. And in the recent Vortex magazine, they did say that uh, there'd be a few extras, but uh, behind the scenes stuff will just be mainly production, not cast. So, what are your thoughts on the vinyl stuff then? Yeah, they are a little bit overpriced, I would say. Even though the Light of the End one, I believe, was like a, a hundred quid or a hundred and ten, I believe, so it is cheaper than Light of the End one. But if I was personally gonna price it, I would have probably put it as uh, fifty quid, but. Yeah, that's just uh, my view on it. I just think uh, 79, 79 pounds or 80 pounds or whatever it is, I'm pushing it off. But it would be lovely. I would like to have uh, definitely the, the Chimes of Midnight in my collection because uh, I love the Chimes of Midnight. Of course, it's a classic. It was voted the best uh, Doctor Who story from the Murphy range, and then Spare Parts coming in a second. They're both brilliant stories. Yeah, but this, this is the question, really. Would I buy a vinyl and get like, a really rare book? It's just that, really. So it's like putting a lot of money on one item, but again, it would be so nice to add uh, to the collection. It's definitely got some nice artwork. Uh, the spare parts and artwork, I've got to say this, it is absolutely damn beautiful. Definitely uh, one of Tom Webster's best designs of all time. That It's definitely... Uh, something to look into, but again, it's the price, it's very expensive, and it really will hurt the wallet, it will, so, I haven't obviously pre-ordered them just yet, but I wouldn't be worried about them, like, go away, there is 500 of them, so it's not a lot of them, but I wouldn't really ro ro worry, sorry, about them, like, going away, like, July, they probably won't, really, because a lot of people were thinking that the 10th Doctor Adventures will 
will be out. You know, printing will be out with them. There's only about 5,000 of them. But, uh, of course, they haven't run out yet, so wouldn't worry about that. So, not sure when to pre-order it. Again, the money's quite crazy high. Mm. Uh, I think that it's quite exciting, personally. Uh, if you were going to reprint the classic Big Finish audios, I think maybe a book format would be quite good. Maybe just get two uh, classic Big Finish stories uh, that are out of print. Maybe just put them in a little booklet. Uh, so you could do like the Fifth Doctor, Six, Seven, Eight, uh, which I think could be quite an interesting concept, and surely people will go and buy it. Uh, but with it being vinyl, a bit this big special release. Uh, 80 quid really is pushing it, especially because on Vinyl Day uh, 2016 we had Doctor Who and the Daleks and Genesis of the Daleks, their soundtracks put on vinyl. Uh, and they were priced at, I think they were priced at 20 to 25 pounds depending on what record shop you went to. And they probably weren't as limited as the Big fi as big finishes, so I don't really think you can put it down to the cost of vinyl uh, being um, being the reason for why it's so high. Because if it was too costly, I doubt big finish would actually do it in the first place. Uh, let alone do five hundred. Like it, with them, I'd expect like two fifty or something like that. If it was supposed to be really expensive to do, uh, personally, I would. I think forty quid is fine. Uh, forty quid is like. Okay, you're pushing it a little, but you know what? It's, it's nice. It'll, be, it'll look great in the collection. I'll pay the 40 quid basically buying a box set. So I think it'd be a lot more interest. I think it'd be a lot more uh, not interest, more of a wiser decision to have done it at 40, 40 to 50, just 80 quid. It that is a bit ridiculous. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It despite the so-called extra stuff, which we're still yet to. But um, in terms of the stuff, I think they've chosen well, because for some people, they haven't got them in physical form, even though you've got a bunch of pages to see the CD stuff has fallen in price, especially the first 50. Some of the, those audios dropped since um, I've been getting the big finished stuff in the first 50. Um, so it, it's sort of a double-edged sword, whether you want to get those big items because I think they would look great signed and, and framed but it'd be quite hard to frame a vinyl I guess but it'd be quite exciting to get Paul McGann's Time Chimes of Midnight um, because it's such a well renowned story and the cover art you know le yet alone is just worth it I guess but it's not a purchase what, th what I think yeah I'd get it um, just because of the simple factor of the price. It, it was just all comes down to the price. If it was 50, I would definitely consider it, but 80 quid is a bit much, really, um, considering you've got the stories already. So, yeah, chimes and spare parts, yeah, I'm not really going to check them out anytime just because of the price, even though the artwork is pretty darn gorgeous, if you ask me. Um, but we've had some brilliant news for the Fourth Doctor. If you're a Fourth Doctor fan, and I and Tom are quite avid fans of the Fourth Doctor range, He's had quite a bit of news because obviously um, he's had five series already come in, five series gone. Um, they're planning series 10 right now as we speak and they finished recording uh, series 7 and 8 just last week with Louise Jameson. So we've got Leela returning in um, series 7 I guess and apparently he's got the Daleks in because um, Barnaby Edwards put a tweet out and he's directing. Um, that and obviously we've had news about series 6 of the stories you know, with not having any of the regular writers, um, with the series finale being by Mark Platt, where Nick Briggs normally takes the duties of writing the final story. And of course, we've had the announcement of Philip Hinchcliffe Presents 2 and 3, or whatever the third box set's going to be called, the Genesis uh, Chamber, which is out in September. So, what are your thoughts on the Fourth Doctor stuff? Well, they're really pushing it until Tom dies, pretty much. Uh, I think it's maybe because it's getting a bit on, so like, you know what, we might as well just p pump as many of them out as we can, but I don't really think that's the right direction, as to be honest, unless I think that uh, it can really affect the stories, uh, they, wouldn't be, they won't be as good, uh, so it's, it, it, you don't, I'm not really sure 
if it is the right decision, to be honest, it just kind of just seems a bit like a money making scheme, to be honest. And I know, oh well, it is. Oh, well, it's all been money making. Well, no, because Big Finish, it, it did start out as a nice little fan thing, some fan to do proper professional fan audio is pretty much what it was. And now it's kind of just for me, it's just becoming this bit of a this corporate machine, just kind of pumping out the same stuff, with the same t- kind of stories, uh, the same hyped crap. Sometimes uh, Toon Coalition. Uh, so just stuff like that. So I I, I kind of think that they maybe are just pushing it a little. Mm, yeah, they are doing That's very. Good. Yeah, they are doing it really fast. If you said they've already recorded series uh, seven and sorry season seven, eight, that's pretty crazy because you know the stories they could have you know rush them and then the quality of the stories maybe the writing maybe not on top but I'm going to stay optimistic with this one I think it's great we're having more stories featuring the fourth Doctor Tom Baker because right now series uh, season 5 got to say this it's been bloody amazing so far you know, the consistency has been brilliant uh, wave of destruction everyone thought it was going to be absolute dog shit but uh, yeah it actually turned out very well I know even 9 out of 10 is still stand strong to that. It's been consistent from start to finish. Haven't um, listened to the trouble, sorry, um, Gallifrey of Ghouls all the way to the Pursuit of History. Haven't listened to those stories just yet. But sounds like it's been uh, pretty consistent so far. Yeah, It's lovely to see uh, more stuff from Tom Baker. But I can see where James is actually coming from. You know, doing all this, maybe the story's a little bit rushed and the quality might drop a little bit and it could be just like a money-making scheme or you know, whatever, but still, it's nice, really, and as well, planning Series 10, they really are going into the future, and yeah, of course, I love the fourth Doctor Adventures, they're absolutely marvellous, and it's nice to have, you know, a lot more audios to come featuring Tom Baker. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be quite interesting, obviously, Philip Inchcliffe um, is a big thing, and obviously, I think with Tom, Big Finish know they're going to get money with Tom, that's where they can up the price, where I think Philip Inchcliffe Presents could be max 15 to 20, not 25 quid, just because they put the extra five because it's Tom Baker. It's not like it's got cast or anything. Um, and I know it's a six-parter, but if you look at um, Cold Fusion, that's 16.99. so why can't we have that? It's just because Tom Baker's name slapped on it, so they think, yeah, we can put an extra tenner on it, um, which is a sad thing, really. Um, because if you're a fan of the fourth Doctor, you've got to pay through the nose to get the Doctor you enjoy, really. Um, but I'm I'm interested to see, you know, what happens after Series Six. How they're going to bring back Leela, because I think I feel like Series Four rounded off Leela brilliantly. Because obviously, Series Three and Series Four, you had that beautiful dynamic of teacher and student, and I feel that that really came full circle in Series Four. So it'll be interesting to see where they're going to take with that, and um, obviously. Tom Baker's got a new companion, so that'd be exciting to hear. I mean, I would love it to be um, um, Liz Shaw's mom. I think she'd be a great little, just have a series of her and the fourth Doctor. I think that'd be a great hoot. And like Tom said, Series 5's been a great batch, so I'm really hoping that the fourth Doctor range can just keep on rolling and just snowballing and getting bigger as the time goes on because series series has just got progressively better. If you look at series one and you look how far it's come in series five, it's just staggering, really. Uh, so that's fourth Doctor covered. Um, now we're practically halfway through the year. Well, we're almost coming towards the end, really, because we've got what nearly five months left of this year. Um, what has been your release of this year so far? It can be a past release or a release of this year so far really so what what's your standout release then so I didn't catch all that question then what's your standout release of the year so far it can be past or future oh, well past or present oh, whatever or do you've listened to uh, this year it doesn't have to be in 2016 yeah, yeah oh. it doesn't have to be 2016 you can have both you can have one from 2016 and one you've listened to from the past you probably have to come back to me on this one Oh, well, right, it's quite easy, quite easy for me because I've not really bought any of the new releases this year, to be honest. 
nothing has really excited me that much. I wasn't, I'm, I personally wasn't really bothered by the Master Trilogy. Um, I just, I, I just not, I'm just not bothered by it. Um, so can't really comment on that. But I've not really listened to that much Big Finish either. It's been it's really busy this year, uh, with the exams and stuff like that. Uh, so it's just been hectic pretty much since January. But the best audio I've listened this this year is, without a doubt, Scorpius. Uh, great, great story. One of my favourite big finishes it's become. Uh, it's just a uh, tremendous little thriller. It's, it's, it's got everything. It's just a bit of a shame that the follow-up episode rarely isn't that good. But Scorpius is just fantastic. Pretty much solid 9 out of 10. Um, it, 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 it's, it, it's just like this futuristic crime drama. Um, and then it, the Cybermen are quite scarce in it, which I think is great because when they do appear, it's like, oh my god, it's a Cyberman. So, yeah, definitely Scorpius, number one, uh, my listen of the year. Yeah, I've got to agree. Scorpius is definitely a standout uh, because we've recently, well, James, well, all of us have got the Cyberman series. And I think mm. we can all say that it is a fantastic series, especially Scorpius. It's just a real treat to listen to. And the way the Cybermen are done within it, you know, I think if you've got to go to a Cyberman series, I've said it before, think the unexpected because that's really what it is because it takes you down one path and then it just flips. It's great. Tom, you ready? Have you decided? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I definitely have to agree with uh, everyone's points on uh, Scorpius. I, I've only listened to that so far on the uh, uh, Cyberman series, but yeah, it was a very good, you know, political story. That was a great stuff for the Cyberman series, but yeah, I haven't picked up the rest of the series one yet. But anyway, I, yeah, I've got my favourite release, and I don't know how it escaped my mind at the start, but yeah, The Apocalypse Element by Stephen Cole. The same writer did Land of the Dead, which was just uh, absolute crap and just a bore. But this was just unbelievable. I was literally blown away by the apocalypse element. He gets rather mediocre reviews by some people. That's really Stephen Cole. You know, his, most of his Dr. Busey books get rather overlooked. And the uh, same thing with his Big Finish audios. But this was just, it was like an epic blockbuster. The sound design in it was wonderful. The Daleks, the constant action. All of it was just so such a moving story. The Sixth Doctor was brilliant. It's the best thing you can get to uh, think that the Sixth Doctor is in the Time War. It's just a you know, marvellous uh, Doctor Who story. Daleks are brilliant in uh, how far they can go to actually um, achieve victory. If they do not win, then they will watch the universe burn. I just think that's brilliant. And the you know, Daleks are blowing themselves up to achieve victory as well. You know, just going as Daleks just go in as far as they possibly can to achieve victory. It's just uh, menacing, they're intimidating, they're a threat, and Stephen Cole just nailed them fantastically. The sound design by Nicholas Briggs is superb. I would probably even give the audio a 10 out of 10 because I didn't really find anything wrong with it. The drive was just so damn strong. The story, it never slowed down. It's just marvellous, it was just absolutely marvellous. And, uh, oh yeah, I'll actually do one from like 2016 so far. I've got to give a shout out to uh, Accutane because that is a marvellous story by some Bernard and Paul Morris. They That's the first time they've appeared in the Murphy Range and they did a two hour story. So it's nice to have, you know, a story which is not really an hour. They, they were stuck to that Companion Chronicles. They did a, that one featuring John Levine. They did. Uh, a few Jago and Lightfoot stories and the story from The Last Adventure End of the Line. It's nice they can go to the two-hour stories, see how they can deliver a nice long mystery story. And yet the story is a quite creepy, fantastic sound design. We've got the brilliant character Hargreaves, who has great uh, great character drive. Accutane is definitely a story you should check out. It's uh, one of the best Fifth Doctor stories. It was just marvellous. Same with the Peace of the Massacre. It's been very good with the Fifth Doctor so far. You're probably wondering why I haven't said the second Doctor Companion Chronicle set, but I actually haven't fully listened to it, surprisingly enough. But yeah, yeah, those are mine. But yeah, Apocalypse Element has been my favourite this year. Yeah, Apocalypse Element is, is great. I reviewed it, I think, last year. 
and it does feel like a very 1960s a plot of it. It does have that 60s element with what the Daleks are doing, but it does have that movie quality to it, which I, I just adore, and it's obviously up and even. And Romana, so it's quite interesting having those three characters um, within it, and the sexually uh, sexual frustrated Dalek in it is just great. It's just worth listening to the, the Supreme Dalek who sounds a bit constipated. Um, but for me... My favourite release from the past has to be Jaguar and Lightfoot Series 5 just because it's so out of the ordinary. Um, I know I praise a lot of Jaguar and Lightfoot stuff because I love the setting of, of Victorian London, but it's something so refreshing having two characters from the Victorian times put into the swinging 60s and just seeing how Jago reacts to that with mini skirts is just great. You've got just mad stuff happening with people eating toads and, and it's just absolutely bonkers and I love it it's just great and it really does expand on some characters arcs especially Ellie's and explains Ellie's a lot more um, just a great series and it, obviously it's got a classic villain returning what Jaguar and Lightfoot may have uh, may have encountered before that's very exciting just to have that um, back but Jaguar and Lightfoot series 5 is probably my favourite Jaguar and Lightfoot series I've listened to so far and coming in a close second is Series 2, but it's very close between those two. But in terms of modern, it's definitely not going to be Doom Coalition, because we all know my thoughts on Doom Coalition. Uh, it's got to be the Peterloo Massacre. I That has converted me into a Fifth Doctor fan. Because uh, if you spoke to me last year, that I would be transfixed to the Fifth Doctor and, and bought loads of his audios, because if you look at my collection from last year, there's hardly any Fifth Doctor stuff. But... Now it just seems to have gone Fifth Doctor crazy. I've bought loads of Fifth Doctor stuff just because of Peterloo Massacre because it's such a beautiful historical story. It may put you off two hours with a Fifth Doctor, pure historical. It might put you off, but it's such a beautiful story. I mean, part three, I really had to take time and take a break just from listening to it because it's such a hard-hitting part. You really need that time to reflect with the events what happened in part three. I mean... Everything, you know, first two parts are building brilliantly to part three. And then when it comes to part four, it boils down to this nice, really good family drama. And that's what it is, a family drama with the Fifth Doctor and his crew just stuck within it. I mean, the recent Fifth Doctor trilogy, you don't really need to buy them all to understand because it's very much a loosely connected trilogy. All you need to know is the TARDIS is a bit malfunctioning. Hang on, the TARDIS is always malfunctioning. So there's no difference for you there really but yeah Peter Lee Massacre probably my standout release of the year so far is spectacular I mean in terms of monthly range I think the two masters is probably second it's just another good story the two masters which leads me on to my next point um, covers we've had some interesting covers this year so what's your favorite and what's your worst cover of this year so far uh, well uh, I think there's been quite a few good covers this year. You know, uh, ISOS Network. I thought was just a uh, it was quite traditional, uh, just quite a nice little cover. Um, Age of Endurance that has not come out yet, but they did announce the cover for that Age of Endurance it's, uh, for the uh, early adventures. Just looks really, really nice. Uh, it's very high definition very well layered uh, and also for another announcement was Fiesta of the Damned a bit of a story that's been a bit of a cover that's been split down the middle by people but I really like it I just think it's a nice little retro cover and you know the Two Masters trilogy had some great covers but my favourite one from that was And You Will Obey Me I think that was the best cover of, from that trilogy uh, only downside about that cover is that the Fifth Doctor's uh, Celery is on the wrong lapel because the fit around the body image. Um, but I think the downright two best are the second Doctor Volume 1 for the Companion Chronicles and Spare Parts because that cover for Spare Parts is just fantastic. I think the layering's great. I'm not that bothered that they used the updated Cyberman uh, to be honest, the kind of thing it works. Uh, you can. Like, I think that maybe they could. Uh, they could have maybe downgraded it a little for the contract for the contrast with Pete Davison, but it doesn't really bother me that much. Uh, what if you actually look at the attention to detail on this cover? It's just fantastic. Just look at the 
uh, Cyberman on the horse, the half converted Cyberman, and look at the old DWM previews for Big Finish audios, and you will see that it has the green tunic like it does in the preview. It hasn't got the handlebars like in the preview. Um, its head has been stitched around around the forehead, uh, so it isn't just that little silver cap that they have on the top. That's not, that you can actually just see that's all skin and just make out all the stitches across. Um, the cyber horse as well has all the gears on its legs that it does in the preview image in DWM. They've gone to that little source material and just done it so well. Uh, just a little bit of detail as well, like they've added like this little uh, militia sort of symbol on his arm. Uh, it, it just all these things on that cover, all these just tiny attentions to detail. You can tell why it took them so long to announce this the cover, like especially when uh, Chimes of Midnight was announced a few months ago. Uh, that cover was, pre was revealed. And, uh, you know, Ch I, Chimes of Midnight cover, I actually quite liked it, but this one just blows it out of the way. Spare parts just looks fab. It's one of, it's probably in my top five big finish covers, to be honest. It just looks great. It's a pretty good cover. Okay, Tom? Right, uh, you know, my favourite cover, I would definitely give this to the second Doctor Companion Chronicles set because just of a major improvement from it. The first stop to Companion Chronicles at Volume One. I mean, it was just so bland, so stale, and hard, hardly any work went into it. It just, it was just not a cover. It was like something like a. Well, this is going to sound quite harsh, but it looked like a draft copy of a cover. But yeah, the second Doctor one, it's just a far much better improvement. So like the blending, like the light effect, red right in the background, lovely. The placement of the companions is greater. It's just overall just a. Brilliant covers, a lot better than volume one. Other covers, oh yeah, I gotta say, uh, as I said, the spare parts of a vinyl edition cover is just wonderful. So much detailing on the cover, it's just wonderful. It definitely wants me to get there, but you know, it's a pricey. But it would look gorgeous in the collection and with a signature as well. Worst cover is a uh, Doom Coalition Ray because. It's just a bit lazy. The background of it, the cogs and gears, it was nicely designed, even though it's been overused. It still looks nice, but the placement of the characters, it looks, it just doesn't look good. It doesn't. Uh, Helen has a really weird you know, face expression. All they've done with the Eighth Doctor is just um, framed him differently. It just seems a little bit, you know, lazy. They couldn't really use to have a you know, picture or anything. It's just a little bit lazy, I would say. Over the song in it as well, it's a little bit weird, and uh, Liv looks grumpy as hell. Not great picture, it's not a great cover, if I'm honest. Original Sin, <laughs> that's a bit of a weird one, like a Chris are holding the sound dog down, yeah. it looks a little bit weird. And uh, yeah, I gotta jump on The Life of Crime as well, that's not, not a great cover. Fiesta of the Damned, yeah, as James said, it looks like it has been split. I personally don't like it at all. If I'm honest, I, I don't like it. I'm not sure who did it. I think it was, actually, yeah, it was Tom Webster who did it. But yeah, at least fair is definitely doing Coalition 3. And that's not a good thing because we all know, it's not a secret, but Doom Coalition has been diversified and a lot of people think it's just an absolute pile of shit, really. And it has been like that. Come on, Doom Coalition 2, it's awful. And Big Finish really need to sort it out as it's got major problems. But... Yeah, the cover, it, it looks like it's sort of uh, solidifying that it's going to be shit, really. Yeah, I never done my worst ones, actually, but I agree with what Tom said there. Um, I, I think this year, this year um, it's not really been necessarily bad covers, besides the ones I've gone through later, but I feel there's been quite a few disappointing ones, like Trouble with Drax, Tom looks awful on that picture, it just looks like this dodgy CGI render that's been uh, contorted and all kinds of things. It just doesn't look good. The Genesis Chamber 
taking the lost stories format. No, it just no, I don't like it. It, it, it oh, oh, I wanted it to be something like the original Philip Hinchcliffe box set. Just I, I, I just don't think it suits having the lost stories style of artwork. Hopefully that's fixed in the next one, uh, but it probably won't. Nightshade, again, that was really uh, disappointing because it didn't really show anything that was about the actual story. Um, like th It doesn't have the radio telescope, it doesn't really have that dark atmospheric uh, feel to it. There's that the dark atmospheric uh, visuals to it that's, you know, described in the book and the audio and... Uh, you know, the, the, the creature, for life of me, can't remember what it's called, has wings on the cover when it doesn't. Um, uh, so that was a bit weird. Uh, just Nightshade, it just looked really lazy, uh, even though it was quite well layered, and I did like some... I, I did like some bits of it, like... Um, it kind of did remind me of... Do you know the later DVD covers, like... Uh, Great show in the galaxy. They kind of look like they were a bit painted, almost. I kind of get the feeling of like, you know, being painted with like just the way Sylvester and Sophie look on it. It's it just got that weird look to it that I kind of like, and it does give me that nostalgia about when the DVDs were out. Uh, but another very disappointing one: Jacob and Lightfoot series eleven. I'm sorry, Ben, but I'm not a fan of that cover. I know that pictures of Jeffrey Beavers can be quite scarce, but it just didn't work with trying to recreate it because he just looked a bit like a baby. I don't know why. He just didn't look scary. He just did not look threatening whatsoever. He just looked silly. Uh, so I, I just wasn't a fan of that, and I felt some of the layering with Colin was a bit off as well. So that was a bit of a... Uh, it was a bit crap, to be honest. A bit disappointing. I expected more... Um, but you know, the downright worst of this year, Death and the Queen. Oh my God, th this is one of the worst. It is dreadful. Like the the, the covers for the for Technophobia and Time Reaver were really really good, and then there's just this where the layering is completely off. There's light bouncing on completely uh, on loads and loads of different places. Donna's part of Donna's head's missing for Christ's sake. You can see where it cuts off. Uh, it, it looks dreadful. Hate the cover. I hate the banner on all of them. Just that that picture of tenants looks awful. I don't. He just looks too skinny. He needs the uh, coat just to just to make him look a a bit more doctorish, I think. And because that's a big staple of what the tenth doctor is, so I rarely think that it should have had the coat on. Uh, as well uh, on the banner because it just doesn't look right. I'm not really a big fan of the clouds in the background, like the Matt Smith intro. I, I'm not sure what that's all about. Um, I would have greatly preferred Tenant's Time Vortex in the background. No one would have complained. It would have just looked fine. Um, Doom Coalition 3, as uh, Tom said, oh, that looks awful. It's got the same format as the past, uh, as a uh, box at one, because it's got the eleven on the left, Doctor in the middle, companions on the right, and it it just it, it just looks so repetitive. I mean, like, I, sorry, let me let me restart that one. It's got the additional character on the left, as with the first box at the eleven. This one has River Song, Doctor in the middle and then the companions on the right. It just doesn't look right. They're too similar. does not work. Layering on River Song is dreadful. Uh, I'm not a fan of that. Life, a Life of Crime. Oh, gee, do I, have to, do I have to talk about that? That's not a good cover whatsoever. Um, layering's off. Uh, I don't like the R on the raccoon. Just so you know, it's a raccoon. Cause it, you can just tell it's not a part of the necklace. It's just placed on... And another one, Original Sin. Awful, awful cover. Should have announced, should have brought this cover forward in like August or September. It, the, the CGI is just completely off. Um, Chris has an enormously long arm because just the way everybody's layered and how uh, big they appear, just Chris's arm 
Chris would need to be way far back. He's got his hand on the doctor, so it doesn't make an awful lot of sense. I'm not a big fan of the, just the layering in general. Just the CGI is dodgy. It really just needed another month or two of work. Yeah. From what I've seen, the reversible cover for the tenant stories aren't much better than the actual covers themselves, really. Um, I'll start with my worst. I'll start with the worst, and then I'll work my way to the best. Uh, Bernie Summerfield, The Unbound. I'm not really a fan of it, to be honest, that cover. It just looks really dodgy, and it just looks too CGI, and it just looks like what you do on a media project, to be honest. Um, original Sin, like what we've mentioned, but just trying to get that CGI landscape with real image, it just doesn't work with the whole sort of weird lights with the purple and yellows. It just really doesn't blend in. And if you look at the cover, you see some nice little details like the silver nemesis side of the gun. But that's about it, really. Doom um, Coalition 3, we've all mentioned. It seems like they're going down the same format for the Wardron and Doom Coalition Cogs. And River Song, she looks like she's from a dodgy porno. Um, yeah, thank you, Alex King. Well, actually, that suits her compared to character. A bit dodgy. And rather sexual, which is just dodgy. Um, and I've got to say, Pursuit of History, I, I think as a build-up for the series finale, it doesn't really look like a grabbing cover. It just goes, oh, this looks really exciting and blockbuster. Um, because this is meant to be a story celebrating five years of Big Finish having combat to me. It doesn't really solidify that. It just says, look, Cuthbert and a weird puppet thing and a rocket. Enjoy. It, it doesn't seem like it would match the story. I haven't listened to it yet, so I don't know if the cover will match the story or whatever the story is crap, and it does match the cover, but that's still yet to be seen. But that's really it for my worst covers. For best covers, um, Maker of Demons, I think it's called, The Last Story of the Seventh Doctor. A trilogy, I think that looks quite an interesting uh, cover. It does seem like uh, very interesting, and it does seem like it will be a very good story. Uh, Doctor, yeah, um, that did the first Doctor one did seem like a sort of product placement image there, just so there you are, first Doctor there. But there's been a lot more time and effort gone into it, like stuff from each story on there. I, I did say. But I just think this is the second Doctor's one's more interesting to look as you've got the thing from the Integral, you've got you know the thing from the Mouthless Dead, um, and it just shows the fifth, uh, the second Doctor off brilliantly because you've got all his companions there from his different era, and it really is um, a nice way to celebrate 50 years of the Troughton uh, years. Um, Two Masters, I actually really do like that, bar the sort of Jeffrey Beaver's image, which does look a bit blurred uh, when you enlarge it, but it's fine. It looks quite nice uh, in person. And on Baker, I've got to say Labyrinth of Buddha Castle. That's probably been my favourite Fourth Doctor adventure of this year so far. Um, and this, the actual uh, cover, it does match the story of this sort of gothic story. Much like The Darkness of Glass, you know, it's very much the same as that, but that cover is quite striking. Put it up against the other series four ones because it's quite a dark cover. So that's it for covers. Now let's go on to the main uh, thing for this hangout, which is Dust Breeding, uh, race number 21, and it is a story where we see a returning villain, the Master. There's no spoiler, it's been out since, what, 2000 and 2002, so it's been out for a bit of a nice little tribute, this sort of thing, because obviously Dog 2 have decided to do this monster month, and the monster or villain is the Master. We were going to do it earlier, um, but like I said, time didn't really happen um, because obviously Big Finish had been really hyping it with the whole Master stuff with the trilogy and Jago and Lightfoot. So we thought this would be quite a fitting one to look at um, because we see the return of Bev, who was first appeared in The Genocide Machine, also written by uh, Mike Tucker. Um, and yeah, this is written by Mike Tucker, if you didn't know. Uh, so if we do our opening thoughts uh, first, and then we're on to characters later, and then I'll see on the story itself. So what are your reading as a whole? Is it okay I can address them? Because I had a, a point about the Nightshade cover, which uh, James was on about. So I'm going to just talk about that and take about Yeah, 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 carry on, carry on. Uh, 
Yeah, you no, know, James is on the back, you know, the cover looks like, you know, it's been painted. I, I think it's gorgeous. And it's a lot like the DVD covers, the late DVD covers, like great showing the galaxy in the mind of evil. Uh, that's because it was by the same person, Lee Biden, Lee Binden, sorry. So that's why it looks uh, similar. So, yeah, I do like the design of uh, the painting cover. So, yeah, it's actually by the same person. <laughs> oh, no, it, be, it being looking painted wasn't, wasn't my problem. That was actually one of my strong points. It just... It was that it just looks that that it, it, it reminds me just that bit of nostalgia, you know, when you'd gone to uh, a shop and you know, oh look, the new Doctor Who DVD DVD is out. That wasn't one of my negatives. That was one of my positives to the cover. I think it just looks really nice. All right. Sorry, is it the open uh, thing on dust breeding now? Yeah, you're opening opening thoughts and summary of dust breeding then. I've uh, heard dust breeding. This is the first time. I listened to it. I listened to it the first half in, like, in the morning and the second half in the evening just take a break as well. Obviously, it's nice to do that with audios. And uh, it was definitely been an interesting one. I've been intrigued by Dust Breeder for quite some time, but I was a little bit put off, I got to say, because it does have, like, diversified, you know, opinions. Some people do have a soft spot for it, and then a lot of people uh, dislike it, but it's not very really a good story. It's rather bland, stale a little bit uh, over the top in some places and just not very of a good sound of the story. But um, when it was starting, I would say I really got into it. It was actually a pretty engaging story. Quite creepy it was. The sound design was pretty good with like a constant screaming from the dust. Where I like one of the characters I uh, said is like Dalek Insanity, which I uh, quite like that. Quite, I can't remember what the character was, but I'll come back to it in a minute. Yeah, I quite like that uh, little line, Dalek Insanity. Yeah, I was really enjoying the first half. I thought it was great, very moving. I said to myself, wow, this is actually uh, pretty underrated. It's quite sad, but a lot of people were, you know, not liking Dust Bringing, because so far, I was saying to myself, it's probably going to be turning out to be one of my favorites from 1 to 50 audios. However, we went to uh, the second half, and oh dear, did it crumble, burn, and just went, well, it actually didn't, I wouldn't say it went absolutely shit, but it just... Uh, it was just underwhelming, it was, really. Part three, the story got a little bit tedious, a little bit boring. I just lost my engagement for the story. And then when part four approached, I went, holy hell, what the hell is happening with the story? It's just, it feels like a different story. It started out being so intriguing, quite creepy with the sound design, and then it just went all bloody crazy and over the top in part four. I said, oh, come on, this is not the direction of the story. It just uh, went all crazy and powerful. I was saying to myself, Mike Tucker, this is not your style. And why have you changed the story so much? It just feels so different or crazy. Yeah, part four, yeah, I could definitely see, but it's definitely the crazy part, and it definitely goes downhill. It's a shame, really. I hate it when stories, they start out so promising at the start, but then just go so underwhelming in the second half, because it can really damage the rating, and it has damaged the rating. If Dust Breeding was going to stay consistent from the first half, I probably would have given the story a 9 out of 10, no problem, because I was so enjoying it. But then we had to, uh, unfortunately, just crumbled in the second half, unfortunately. So, um, so yes, yeah, sadly, I won't be calling this a classic Doctor Who Big Finish audio. It's rather underwhelming. Uh, well, I've got a, I've got quite a different opinion to Tom. I really enjoy dust breeding. I think it's quite a consistent story all the way through. Um, I was satisfied with the ending, uh, and yeah, I, I just really enjoyed it. I listened, funny enough, when I listened to this first time, um, I was actually slap bang in the middle of my uh, GCSE art exam, and I think that's quite fitting, um, but because. Uh, you know, just that two things. Because this story, uh, it, it all kicks off because of art, and it touches upon the ignorance of the art world, which I quite enjoy because I I like to draw and stuff like that, but I don't like art. I hate museums. I hate uh, pro, uh, the. I hate really. I hate uh, pretentious artists. Rarely encounter, rarely encounter quite a few of them. Um, they, they do my nutting, so 
and was quite satisfied to uh, sort of uh, hear these these people get their just desserts pretty much. Um, it, 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 and they do it in such a comedic way as well. And that I, I just can't, it was almost like a parody of sorts that I, I, I thought was quite genius, to be honest. Um, yeah, uh, so, yeah, dust breeding, I, it, it really, I just think that it could have been better in some parts. Like There are bits that kind of just drag a little, but, you know, early days of Big Finish. What was this, 21st release or something like that? Um, yeah. Oh, well, bang on. Uh, so, yeah, early days for Big Finish, but to be honest, I think it's a pretty solid story. Great way to reintroduce the Master, and yeah, we'll talk about the Master later on when we come to the uh, characters. Yeah, for me, just being like I said, was the first non Paul McGann audio I listened to. Um, mm. And I thought, yeah, this is a pretty good, solid story. They got to part four, and I've got to be honest, since we're listening to it, because I listened to this way back in 2014. Um, around about May, I guess, because I was doing my exams. Um, and to revisit it, it was quite nice, because I've actually grown a bit more of an appreciation of it, because I think that the music really does have this nice 80s feel to it, and you can easily see this being part of the Seventh Doctor's era. And the sound design with the constant screams in the background just adds this nice little chilling atmosphere. And like James said, um, if you're an art fan, then this is definitely going to be a good story for you, a nice little throwaway line about Mona Lisa, about the Seventh Doctor saying this is a fake, which I love the City of Death, it's my favourite Fourth Doctor story, and so it's quite a nice little thing to have that uh, within it, but um, it's interesting how it uses art as a concept, especially the screen, because the screen is definitely an integral part of this plot, and it's definitely used to it as an interesting plot device within the story. I mean, part one, I think, is a great set with um, the creation of the screen, you know, the first scene is about the creation of how that painting came to be, which I like because I like when Doctor Who sort of says, here's our take on events in history and all that. Um, and it really does build up this world of Duchamp uh, 331, I think it is. And you get these nice little character interactions between Ace and, and Bev and the Doctor. Um, and I quite like that you sort of get two cliffhangers in one uh, within part one. And part two... It answers questions, but it still raises a few more, so it, it keeps you intrigued. And Mr. Sita, I think this is when he starts to come into play um, within the story. we talk about Mr. Sita in a minute. Um, and we actually see, uh, you know, how Vril um, came into this story, because the Krill were first in a book, I think, uh, Storm Harvest. Um, I'm not sure if Tom's read it. Um, nope, but that is obviously not. this story. Yeah, because it, obviously the Doctor and Ace have encountered the Krill before because it is referenced within that Ace has encountered them. Um, part three, well, actually, I've got to say, part two's cliffhanger is like a proper classic uh, cliffhanger. It does have that classic oomph to anything. Yes, this is a good cliffhanger. Part three, I think this is when the story actually starts going. I think the rest of the story to that point was just slogging along, and then part three comes along, and this is when the action starts going and the intensity starts to rise as we start to know why the Krill are there um, and what Mr. Seat is doing and why the Krill are needed within this. And I think that it gives Sylvester McCoy's Doctor something very interesting to do. So I think part three to me is the standout part within this story. Um, sadly, that's just lost in part, f um, part four. I think the only redeeming thing in part four for me is being between the Doctor and um, the master, um, because it just adds a new sort of dynamic within it. But then halfway through the story, it just loses it and it just goes down a different direction. I didn't want it down with the whole sort of I I've called it the Rings of Akaten thing, this whole sort of planet coming to life, because that's what it is really. It's got this really wacky performance, is what we we'll talk about in a minute. But to me, it just loses this atmosphere. It built up in the other three, it just goes down a different path, which I do not like, um, leading to sort of... I, I've got to be honest, I found the ending a bit dissatisfactory on the way it was resolved. Um, it did seem a bit of a cop-out, um, really. But, uh, yeah, that's my thought. Let's go on to characters. What are our thoughts on the characters and performances within this story? Uh, Tom, can you go first, or drop me? Oh, I don't mind. Uh, well, I'll go first then. 
uh, characters in this story, uh, well, it's going on about the Doctor first. Uh, the Doctor in this story, I, I feel it's a bit more darker in this story. Um, it, to me, it really does feel like a bit of a successor to season 26 in a way. Um, it, it just kind of just feels right. It kind of, it's one of the, it, for me, it, this story, it kind of feels like this was under the reign of like, the Cartman Master Plan. And like, even Andrew Cartman just kind of feels like he worked on this. Uh, because it, it just, it, I think it just fits into that era really well. So you can say, oh yeah, I've got uh, this just, uh, quite, you can just smoothly put this in the timeline, just go, you know, oh, this is after season 26. Uh, it's pretty obvious because of that. And uh, uh, the Doctor in, in the story, um, again, as I said, a lot more, it's a bit more dark in the story, it's a lot more mature, um, it's a bit more serious, it kind of does have a bit of a joke sometimes, so it kind of does get that little balance in, which is quite good as well. Apes, uh, I feel as if it is a bit more old, it, I just feel she's a bit more older in this, she's a bit more wiser, she has uh, gained a bit more experience, so... I guess you could say maybe a, a few years after survival, something like wherever you want to put the timeline because it's big finish, scattered about everywhere pretty much. Uh, so Ace in the story, just nice seeing uh, Ace as this full-rounded woman in the story pretty much. So uh, I did enjoy that as well because Ace is you know, one of my favourite companions. Well, she is my favourite companion. Sorry. Uh, I love her to bits. Um, so, yeah, loved Ace in the story. Bev... Bev appeared in a story called The Genocide Machine, uh, which I have. Uh, it was one of my first big finishes. Uh, but I really don't remember in that st- her in that story. I remember Genocide Machine quite well, but I just don't remember her, her in it. I need to go back and re-listen to Genocide Machine. But Bev in the story, I think she's a lot of fun. I love how she's just complaining. She's just like, she's just like for fuck's sake, I'm stuck on this shit all over planet. I want to go. And I just think that's great. Um, she was very enjoyable, and I just rarely did enjoy Bev in this uh, story. Uh, it, it just it gave that just a little bit of life into this bit of a gloomy story because you know the setting of the story, this big sandy planet, it's oranges and browns everywhere. Um, so yeah, uh, I, so yeah, uh, it, it, just a bit, just a bit of colour put into the story in, in, in the character, um, and the story features Caroline John as Madame Salvadori, if I've said that right. Oh, she's funny. Uh, of course, she does put on an accent in this uh, story. I can't pinpoint what it's supposed to be, whether uh, hi- the, uh, this high-class German it? accent. Yeah, it kind of does fluctuate. And I think, I, I don't know, I just kind of think that's just part, a part of the parody. Do you know how... like? Uh, it, because this story, it doesn't really take it's it, it, it's a serious story, but it it can have a little joke. And Madame Salvadori is a parody joke character because pe- because it's quite a bit of a stereotype for really uh, posh people to put on accents like the uh, the, the put on accents and just try and sound a bit a bit more posh. And with Madame Salvadori, she's just trying to push her accent a little bit further, just to try and sound a bit, just to try and stand out from the crowd. And go, oh, yes, I am this high-class uh, art dealer. Uh, I yes, and uh, I, I am very well educated and stuff like that. It, it just a part of the parody of the story. Uh, with uh, and the and the story again, it does take a little digs at the art world and stuff like that. You know, just the pretentiousness. Uh, uh, all of them just gathered around. Uh, 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 there's a really good scene where they're observing uh, Mr. Sita's mask as well. Uh, but, uh, I think that's quite a uh, little good scene. I uh, see so, yeah, this story. It just it it's got all these kind of different characters. The the mad people on uh, the planet uh, on the on the planet of uh, Two Champ Three Three One. These mad people on the other side of the mad spectrum uh, with all these pretentious art people like uh, Madam uh, Salvadori and all that and then the Doctor and Master there it's just all these wonderful little characters all just put into this setting it's uh, it's not like if you just put different people from different areas of the country and just throw them in a room and just have them make a conversation I just think it's really enjoyable the Master in the story oh I fell in love with Jeffrey Beaver's uh, just listening to this uh, even more uh, 
because I was really impressed with him and Mast about this, or Jeffrey Beavers. He encompasses every master up to that point into one, which I think is handled really well because it, 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 at, the, at the starting at the start, he's a lot. He's, he's a lot like Del Dardo, I feel, uh, especially where you know he's pretty much uh, first proper master words. I'm going to say, but he's kind of revealed as master. And he goes, "I am the master, and you will obey me." Uh, I really did enjoy that. It maybe could have been delivered a tiny little better, but it, it just really was a nice little tribute to. Uh, Ross Delgado as well. He's a lot more pantomime in places. I feel a lot like Ainley. Uh, and, you know, a little bit camp in some parts, uh, but not to the pure extent of uh, the TV movie master. But we just, uh, and it just encompasses all these masters. It's a nice little tribute, I feel. Um, the master's mask as well. I've got to talk about this. Uh, I think this is a wonderful uh, little piece of visualization art because it's appeared in Doctor, in Doctor Magazine and it's kind of become a bit iconic amongst big Finnish fans um, and you know Batman March, I give, I give him so much praise, uh, is one of my favourite YouTubers in his 8th Doctor series, he uh, gave the master this mask uh, just kind of took that little bit of inspiration from the story uh, and just adapted it into his 8th uh, Doctor series 3 and that really worked as well. Uh, so you can really see uh, that this story, even though it may be underrated, it does stand out in the minds of some big Finnish fans as well. And yeah, okay, Tom. Uh, that's me. All right, Tom. All right, yes, to the characters, uh, the Doctor, even though you can see on the cover that it's like a quite, you know, dark, and like the sound for Doctor being in the shadows and all that, so you can... The cover is like a, you know, solidifying a bit of it. It's going to be a dark story. It's going to be the Sam Doctor, of course, we all know and love being with dark, you know, serious. And he is in this story, especially in part three. It's definitely a very uh, intense, uh, you know, tense moment mm. in that part three. I'll let people experience that for themselves when they do get death screen, because that's definitely quite an interesting and uh, tense moment mm. uh, with the Sam Doctor. But yeah, performances were great. I have stated in a uh, my science of time review, but for the South Doctor, it did take him, you know, he was like the Doctor which uh, had the hardest time to get into audio, the Fifth Doctor and the Sixth Doctor and the Signs of Time. Uh, did feel like they got comfortable in audio quite quickly, but the South Doctor, I could tell when listening to the audio, he was the one that he was uh, struggling the most. Just when the South Doctor was like trying to shout in Signs of Time, it didn't really sound very realistic or believable, so he had the hardest time to get into audio, but very quickly, he got comfortable. Like in the Fear Manga, he was brilliant. Uh, Genocide Machine as well, fantastic. And here, his performances are absolutely wonderful. So, yeah, Celeste Lucor, he had some... He, it was quite hard for him to get into the audio, but, you know, recording in front of a camera, to voice acting, it's a lot different, but still. Celeste Lucor did brilliant in the story. Definitely had his moments. Ace, I would say her performances in this were pretty brilliant, and she was, a, uh, you know, had some... Pretty good scenes. I remember one of the moments where she was um, shouting uh, quite loud. That was uh, pretty good as well. And uh, nice interactions with Bev Tarrant, who is uh, a wonderful character. She's in a uh, quite a few big Finnish audios actually, not just uh, the uh, Genocide Machine, which was an uh, introduction by, of course, the same writer Mike Tucker. She's also appeared in a few Beneath Summerfield stories, such as the Bellatron incident, a, a story I haven't, I've listened to about a few months ago that was pretty good, she's in that, she's in a few Beneath Summerfield stories I think a few comics, I might be wrong by there, but yeah, she's a, a very a good character, we have a, a Garfrey, I can't remember his name, but he was the character who uh, did the line of a Dalek Insanity, because it's like a nice part of the story where he explains that a, a Dalek saucer crashed onto the planet and then sunk into the sand of the planet and uh, the, all that dust screaming is a part of the Dalek insanity but they've been trapped in the, the planet under the dust and they're still there. I found that pretty cool, I did. I would mention the crew, actually, because no one's talked about them yet. Of course, they appeared in a BBC book uh, for this called uh, Storm Harvest. haven't read the book for myself, but apparently it is a very good book and a lot better than... Uh, Dust Breeding, but I'm yet to say that for myself. That was also a collaboration with Robert Perry as well. But for Dust Breeding, it's just Mike Tucker on his own. Very uh, 
vicious monsters are, when they appeared in part two. My goodness, what a fantastic cliffhanger. That put me on the edge of my seat. And that's where I was saying to myself, yeah, this is definitely turning out to be a classic audio. And again, there was some intense moments. Uh, the intensity does increase in part three, even though I had peace and issues with it. And the story sort of slogged down for me. They were still, they had some brilliant moments. They were, you know, carnivorous. They were, the, the krill were fantastic. But apparently they're a lot better in Storm Harvest, the book. So definitely going to read that book in the future. And of course, we'll talk about... Uh, the brilliant uh, master by Jeffrey Reeves, the first appearance of the mass of the master in a big finish audio, and what a fantastic performance! He's quite uh, devious and quite secretive in his actions and his movements in part one. And I love his introduction where he uh, reveals himself into the story. He plays that really like creepy piano music when he's uh, introduced. I thought, oh, what a nice touch! That was absolutely brilliant. That was absolutely magnificent as well. Uh, Damien Pearson, I would say the less said about him, the better, because he's quite connected with uh, the art plot and all that concept as well, and the dust and all that. You can see his character is quite connected to it, so the less said about him, the better. But brilliant performances by John Johnson Willis, I believe his name is. Definitely great performances to him. Anyone else? I would say they were really the standout ones. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, Madame Sadori by uh, Caroline John. It's nice to see uh, her in this Big Finish audio, as I actually didn't even know that she was in the Big Finish audio until I actually looked at the cast list. But it's nice to see her bring some nice comedy to the story. Yeah, by the cover, it does look serious, but it does have its wacky and rather crazy moments of story. It has its fair, fair share of comedy, but it's uh, both its balance style and utilised very well. It still has its serious moments. It's quite a serious story. It's both balanced style. Well, the strongest performer, yeah, I'll definitely give it to Jeffrey Beavis because he just sounds so devious in his first big finish audio. He definitely nailed his performance, and I enjoyed him from start to finish, even if the second half was rather, well, crumbling. The story was crumbling by there, but still, Jeffrey Beavis was a strong driver of the story. Voice acting was superb, and he's still going on extremely well. Yeah, definitely thumbs up to Jeffrey Beavis. Yeah, I've got to say that every character in this is very quirky and very unique, um, and they're very bombastic. Some of them are. Some of them are too over the top. Where you just think, yeah, you've, you've gone over the line. They've really just car uh, caricatured some characters. Um, Sylvester McCoy, the Doctor. I've got to be honest. I found him a, a bit jarring in places, especially the first two episodes. I I found that he didn't know how to pitch his Doctor whether to be funny, to be serious. I found that Sylvester didn't know how to pitch his own Doctor, which I found kind of odd, because in the Fear Monger I thought, yeah, he's nailing this, but then I really visited Dustbrain and I felt, you're not really pitching it right. I'm not what you're doing, Sylvester. But that aside, he does get those nice moments. He does get a nice light-hearted moment in the TARDIS in episode one. Um, he's got this nice sort of dark and brooding quality as the story progresses, um, especially part three. I think that's when Sylvester just clicked to me. I think that's when he finally clicked into the role. Um, but then in part four, he just slipped out of it again in some moments, especially uh, towards the climax moments of the story. Um, but yeah, pretty good performance nonetheless, I guess. Sophie Aldred as Ace. I've got to be honest, I think she's probably the best um, character um, within this room, best performance, as I think that it really does character, characterise Ace as we see Ace vulnerable and a really nice sort of innocence to her when we see uh, her in the end of episode one. We, we see, you know, Ace is quite a headstrong character and, you know, she doesn't like to show fear. So it's quite nice to see Ace have that bit of fear factor in her and just to see that she is just like a normal person, this hard nut, like she says she is. She can be quite violent at times, you know, when she raises her voice, you can get a sort of a sense of threat from her, that she's quite demanding. And um, we learn a bit more about her, about her education, about art, doing an O-level in art. Um, I've got to say about the Krill, actually. The Krill, I think you do get a sense of threat from them. But I don't think they're utilised to their best advantage. I think they could have been more within what involved in the story. Obviously, they're part of the plot. Okay, can we actually see that a bit more in action than just have them as sort of the bodyguards, really? I would like to see them do a bit more 
um, in terms of story actually progress um, in terms of character. Then we've got Madame Salvadori, um, who I think is fantastic. Caroline Jones does a fantastic job uh, being this eccentric and quite bombastic character. And I love the bit when she's sort of saying her name and it's just really long and Bev's just like, yeah, yeah, I get it. I just love that moment. She's quite influential, very eccentric. I just love her. She's quite impatient and she likes to be quite flash and well-to-do, you know, um, especially trying to show off to all these sort of art critics. I just love that because they're all potential but she's just thinking about the money. I absolutely love her. Bev, and from what I remember, I think this is a story where we actually start to see her fleshed out as a character. I think this is where we get to see Bev um, a bit more. I'd like to see maybe some more Bev adventures with the Seventh Doctor. Obviously, we're talking ten years ago, so it's looking unlikely. Uh, Jeffrey Beavers, he's just sly and smooth. I think that's the best way to describe him in this story because he's very much lurking in the shadows in the first two episodes. And then when it comes to the second half, we get the full master. And, and the sound design is as well, because you really get the sense that he is in a mask. So I think the sound design is brilliant. It really does help um, that. And I think the way Mike Tucker plays with the master, because it sort of hints his identity with the whole sort of body, and you get him coughing, um, and the mask, it just really does work in that hinting at his character. And also the way he describes humans, the master. I mean, I think it's episode three how he just says they're puny and inconificent uh, for him, really. Um, but yeah, performances are pretty good. Um, Mr. Gulver, I think, is I think he's quite an interesting character, um, with him sort of holding secrets because he's been on Dushan three 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 uh, three three one um, all his life since this incident. So it's quite nice to see his character character progress as the street goes on. Um, so yeah, great performances. Some are a bit over the top and just make me cringe a bit. And Sylvester, yeah, he really needs to find the pictures doctor within this story. So let's go into our overall thoughts and then our um, ratings on this story then, shall we? Uh, yeah. Overall thoughts on Dust Raiden. Certainly a enjoyable listen. Because I'm happy I have finally listened to Dust Breeding, but it just didn't really deliver on its uh, promises. Because from the cover, I thought it was going to just be a very uh, creepy like, space horror story, and creepy dust and all that. It did sound very good, but unfortunately, it just didn't really uh, live up to it. Because in part four, it just changed all the atmosphere, all the intensity. Sam Fadog, yeah, I agree on Ben a little bit. Not, I didn't really get this problem in part one, part two, but I did get it in part four. It's just the doctor completely changed, and it just uh, didn't work at all, so that was uh, unfortunate. Part four is definitely the, the weakest, even though I wasn't really a fan of part three, it sort of dipped down after that, but part four is just rather definitely the weakest part, and it definitely detracts from the rating. But performance is good. It's nice to have uh, Jeffrey Brevis and Caroline John the same audio as well. That's pretty nice. But unfortunately, it's not a classic, and I would probably give it 6 out of 10. Um, yeah, was that, are you done, Tom? Sorry. Yeah, I'm done. Oh, okay. Um, not sure if it was just simple, wasn't it? Um, but yeah, I, again, I've got pretty different opinions from Tom again, as I said before. The dust breeding, it's very consistent on the story. Um, I, I love that there's just twists around every, uh, there's just twists and plot reveals around every corner pretty much. <laughs> um, uh, the story of how uh, it, it delves into uh, you know how the master became crispy and it puts the crispy master in a in a timeline so you can so you go all right that's where the master is. Uh, which I think is a good enough reason to buy this, especially if you're, uh, especially if you enjoy like, the law of uh, Doctor Who and stuff like that. Just so you, just so you know uh, uh, where this master is at, and it may surprise you. It may not, uh, but uh, you'll have to see. Uh, again, with this story, uh, what I love about this is that it already has established law of this planet. Um, and I, I really think when you have established law and actually weave that in, uh, actually weave that into the plot and in some parts as well, then it makes the environment feel a lot more real. Uh, 
because sometimes you can just have a bit of this cardboard cutout space station or this cardboard cutout uh, planet or just the, wherever wherever you are, you can just say, oh yeah, we're in France in 1982. There we go, that's all you need to know. Oh, we're on the planet Deflons 5 in the Chromia galaxy. And you don't really think anything about it. And it's, uh, it but with this planet, but with this uh, story, I mean, uh, it, because the whole planet is alive, it, it having all this established law about the Daleks crashing down, uh, little legends spoken about the planet as well, it, it makes it really just feel real and does fit into the tone of the planet being alive as well. So... Uh, I will give the story props to that, as they did uh, go into th they did think about it quite well. Uh, the krill, I think, are great. They're very, very tense. Uh, they are they're quite disgusting in some ways as well, and freaky. They they are just a very traditional monster. I want to say very traditional Doctor Who monster, and I am quite impressed the big finish. I think they made an actual model of the krill for the cover, uh, or they may have just borrowed that from the cover of Storm Harvest, uh, because I th it may use the same model. I'm not too sure, but I know on the little disc insert it has seven and come face-to-face -face with the krill, which is quite funny when you rip it off as well. Uh, but yeah, the story thing's great. Uh, Jeffrey Beavers kills it as the master. is fantastic. Uh, you know, I just wish Jeffrey Beavers... I always wish he'd done more... Uh, main range stuff, but again, glad that we're getting that with uh, the uh, Masters trilogy as well, if I ever decide to pick that up, uh, but I think that may be a bit of a while, because I've just got all the things up, uh, that I want to buy first, and maybe go back to that as well, but yeah, uh, just reading, to be honest, I'd give the story 8 out of 10, I think that it's one of my favourite big finishes. Whoa. I'm um, going back to the crispy master thing. That seems quite interesting because obviously you've got this, and then the two masters plays with the whole idea of the crispy master. So it's trying to fit what sort of way you want him to go crispy, really, if you know what I mean. Mm. Um, but for me, dust breathing, um, it started off so well. I thought, yeah, this this has got better. Um, you know, it was looking around the 8 out of 10 mark around the first half, and then it pushed up to a little bit more in the third part, and then it just plummets drastically uh, down, because the story has a lot of potential, it has quite a nice little storyline, and quite a bit of drive, but it does have padding. Padding's main issue, um, I find, with this story. Um, and obviously, with the rather uh, bizarre sort of part four, it's a bit hard to say and how to place it really, but for me, I'm, I want to say a 7 out of 10, that's what my heart's saying, but in my sense, so I'm going to give it 6 bits of dust out of 10, so it's a pretty, oh, it's above average, um, I mean, I would say it's it's worth checking out just because it's the first master story, um, and obviously there's not much solo um, Seventh Doctor and A stories, because obviously Hex would later up here. I think that's where it sort of takes my enjoyment out of the Seventh Doctor. So, yeah, I I'd like to see more Seventh Doctor and A stories. Um, because Nightshade, that was a big redeeming for me. With Nightshade, just to have the Seventh Doctor and A back together. Um, but just breathing, yeah, six out of ten. Uh, so that concludes Big Finish fans. We'll be back um, in another review, which will be a companion chronicle of Mahogany's, um, because we may be starting a little series. Uh, Mahogany Murderers goes down, and we'll see you in that. So thank you very much for the lovely people who have joined me this evening, and we'll see you in the next one. So thank you very much for watching, and goodbye. Bye-bye.